Despite being a relatively new illness, Ebola manages to strike fear into the hearts of many. It conjures images of extreme pain and suffering, of the 2014 epidemic in West Africa, and of hazmat-clad health workers putting their lives on the line. Ebola is a widely misunderstood illness, one surrounded by myths elevating the disease to apocalyptic levels. That is not to say that the disease does not pose a huge risk to many. In today's video, we will cover the history of Ebola, the pandemics that define the terror related to the disease, and what is being done to better combat the virus. Ebola is a viral hemorrhagic fever, meaning it is capable of causing failure of the patient's organ systems and damages the cardiovascular system, rendering the body incapable of functioning on its own. The first notable symptoms of Ebola are a sore throat, muscle aches, and fever, and or chills. Soon, symptoms will include vomiting, diarrhea, rashes, and kidney failure. Around this stage, a patient will often begin to hemorrhage, both internally and externally. It is important to note that only when symptoms start to appear is when a patient becomes contagious. Therefore, identifying and recognizing the symptoms is vital for containment of the disease. The Ebola virus will spread amongst non-human primate species and bats for much of the time. This is what is known as a natural reservoir for the virus. The bats that carry the virus will not suffer any of their symptoms previously mentioned, allowing for infection into humans at any given time. In what is termed as a spillover event, Ebola is transmitted through all manner of infected fluids, including the usual vectors of blood, urine, and saliva. It is also capable of being spread via semen, breast milk, vomit, and sweat. If the virus can enter a person's body through an open cut or through the eyes, nose, or mouth, the infection will take hold. Once infected with the Ebola virus, it will incubate for anywhere from 2 to 21 days. Once in the body, it will attack the immune system, destroying cells and leaving the patient with little in the way of detecting or combating the virus. One key target for the Ebola virus are the dendritic cells. These cells are found in the immune system and, in essence, absorb viruses. They give instructions to the immune system to produce specific antibodies for the pathogen. In targeting these early warning system cells, the Ebola virus is able to trick the host into not producing antibodies. The Ebola virus will enter the bloodstream and the lymphatic system before spreading throughout the whole body. For many patients, there will be a large number of leaks in the blood vessels caused by damage to the cells, leaving the patient with no blood pressure, drastic drops in body temperature, and the body entering into a state of shock. For others, they will succumb to Ebola following the destruction of too many of their cells, which can trigger an extreme autoimmune response that is damaging to the host in what is termed a cytokine storm. The body launches an all-or-nothing attempt to rid the body of the virus with drastic measures employed. Such measures will damage the blood vessels further, thinning the blood, causing the patient to bleed internally and externally. Once a person dies from Ebola, usually from blood loss and the associated complications, the patient's body is at its most contagious. Extra precautions need to be taken when dealing with the body, with all contaminated clothing and bedding carefully disposed of. Specialist teams are employed to carefully and respectfully bury the bodies of the dead to avoid any further spreading of the disease. As simple as it may sound, one of the best ways to avoid the spread of Ebola is to ensure hands are washed thoroughly throughout the day. The first case of Ebola dates to 1976 and took place in the town of Nazara in Sudan, which is now modern-day southern Sudan. The very first patient was a cotton factory worker, who at first was thought to have contracted malaria, not realizing it was a novel disease. Two more workers at the same factory soon became ill with the same illness, all three succumbing to Ebola. In total, the initial outbreak resulted in 284 cases, 
resulting in 151 deaths. A deadly hemorrhagic fever presented a new problem, along with a mortality rate of over 50%. For those who survived, recovery was slow and arduous. It's believed that the initial infections took place in the cotton factory, likely from contact with bats that dwelt in the rafters. Towards the end of 1976, 318 cases with 280 deaths occurred in Zaire, which is the modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo. These outbreaks were two entirely different strains and not at all related to one another, but signalled the arrival of a new, incredibly deadly disease. It was from the second outbreak in Zaire that the disease would gain its name. The initial patient had gone on a business trip near the Ebola River. For the next few years, a handful of cases would occur mainly in Central Africa. Gabon and Uganda soon joined the list of countries affected. But it was in December of 2013 that a shocking outbreak would begin that would take hold within West Africa. The first patient is believed to be a young toddler in Guinea. It is understood he consumed bushmeat infected with the virus. Soon after, he and his entire immediate family died. By January of 2014, a medical emergency was declared. The Ebola virus had largely remained in rural areas but was now taking hold in major cities. A lack of meaningful tracking of the disease and an ill-prepared and poor healthcare infrastructure led to the spreading of Ebola to the neighbouring countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone in July of 2014. On the 8th of August 2014, the situation in West Africa was officially declared as a public health emergency of international concern by the WHO. In the following months, Ebola in a limited way was able to spread to Mali, Senegal and Nigeria. A number of Western healthcare workers who had spent time in West Africa had contracted the virus and brought the disease home. This in turn sparked fears that Ebola would soon take hold all around the world and with the high mortality rates cause a huge loss of life. But soon enough, the affected West African countries started to declare themselves Ebola free. By gaining the support of local leaders in disseminating proper prevention and with the coordinated implementation of healthcare policy, the spread of the virus was reduced and the outbreak was brought to an end. By the end of the epidemic, some 28,600 people had been infected, with 11,310 dead. Due to the pandemic caused by the fear of Ebola outbreaks in the West, a number of misunderstandings arose. The high fatality rates can be attributed to a lack of proper medical attention. If caught early enough, a patient has a better chance of survival by providing basic medical interventions. The giving of intravenous fluids and medications to deal with the low blood pressure, vomiting and diarrhea greatly improves the chance of survival. Sadly, such treatment proved too costly for many patients, and the lack of adequate medical facilities only made matters worse. One major fear attributed to Ebola is that it might mutate to become an airborne disease. Many point out just how devastating the illness would be if it did mutate as in its present form, containment is far easier. However, no virus that affects humans has ever changed its mode of transmission. For example, the idea that the HIV virus might become airborne is not something that is given much thought. In terms of combating the Ebola outbreaks, one major method will be managing the interactions with animals that carry the virus. The consumption of bushmeat has been linked to the introduction of the disease into humans. And so education around the dangers of eating primates is vital. If Ebola does enter the human population, the use and proliferation of personal protective equipment, robust hygiene measures and decent healthcare facilities will work to stop the spread and save lives. As our technology develops, the monitoring of genetic changes and contact tracing will help limit the devastation. These methods cost money, but for those fearful of airborne mutations, it's surely a small price to pay.
Whilst Ebola is no doubt a deadly disease, it is very much limited by its transmission methods. Containment does prove to be effective, and those at highest risk of contracting the disease are healthcare workers and friends and family of an infected person. Yet, even with a low comparative death toll to other illnesses, Ebola will likely remain as a disease that is feared, and one that is not well understood. I would invite you all to read a little further into the disease, as it is through understanding that we can better combat illnesses that would otherwise run rampant.